Canal Flats, which is basically the source, the headwaters of the Columbia River. And then I'm gonna paddle north um, up until Micah Dam, and then I take a big old arc to the south, head down through the state, or through Washington State, and then to the Oregon border, cruise my way on and out to the ocean. 2,000 kilometers, 1,243 miles, 14 dams. British Columbia is put to the torch by the BC government to make way for floodwaters rising behind the dam. Form this act to fulfill our obligations under the terms of the Columbia River Treaty. The Columbia River Basin as an entirety, a trans, the transboundary Columbia River Basin, is a basin of commanding size and complex hydrology. Uh, currently there are 14 major dams on the main stem of the Columbia River, which runs about 2,000 kilometers from its headwaters at Canal Flats all the way down to the mouth of the river uh, at Astoria, Oregon, just below Portland. So a, a basin of that size includes portions of seven states and one province and it has a complexity of hydrology that allows for over 400 dams throughout the entire basin which is the size of France. One of the richest hydrological resources on the continent and perhaps even in the world. We who live here uh, are part of the Upper Columbia system, which is without question in my view as a researcher and studier of the landscape over many years, really the womb of the entire system. Ku'umso Arrow Lakes people. Ku'umso, the people of the place of the bull trout. The Arrow Lakes. Like our connection is so strong with the river. We had an indigenous people who traveled back and forth traditionally across the border. Well, this was not a border for them. 20% uh, of their traditional territory was in what we now call Washington State, and 80% of it was surrounding the main stem of the Columbia. And the settlers moved in. They had um, far less places where they could filter out into. And so they naturally drifted south, uh, in part because the U.S. had established a reservation there 30 to 50 years earlier uh, and so for the Sinaiks there was a safe haven there where families could gather and be present and here there were just unending pressures on their traditional territory because of mining and settlement and many other factors. We didn't forget who we are. Who's an Aichkist? Umsot Arrow Lakes. I think it's important to emphasize when we talk about displacement, I think the way the historical record treated this issue and the way the Crown uh, Government of British Columbia continues to position themselves on the issue of the Sinaiks and their displacement is that they were just sort of naturally drifting away from their traditional territory, which in fact is absolutely untrue and uh, not borne out by their own version of the story. Their own version of the story is they were in a sense refugees um, who had nowhere safe that they felt they could be. Our blue card, you know, it doesn't say Colville. I mean, at the top it says Colville Confederated Tribes, but it's Arrow Lakes Band. There was so much life and settlement in this valley. The Sinaiaks were unfortunately displaced from their land very early and European settlement 
took its place. But there was a lot, there were people living all through here, right where we're standing. There are no words really to describe the depth of loss um, on, on many levels, uh, one of which is a population that is of individuals, human beings, that are al allowed to love where they live, that are allowed to bond to it, that are allowed to interact with natural systems the way agricultural people do. Before the Columbia River Treaty, they were self-supporting and able to pay their own way. So they lost more than just land. They lost years, and they lost their independence. Everyone knew that the uh, Hyero Dam was going to be built in Castlegar, but nobody really knew too much. BC Hydro had representatives that would come in and uh, to uh, purchase the property. Um, Usually they sort of slid in and, and tried to uh, meet with property owners uh, independently, one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, a lot of people weren't prepared or didn't know their prices. And consequently, we're either threatened, if you don't settle for this price, we're going to take it anyway, or whatever. Um, so it really was poorly done on uh, BC Hydro's and the government's behalf. It really did let the people of the whole valley, from Revelstoke all the way down to Burton uh, and throughout that whole area, there's a lot of bitterness and uh, disrupted a lot of uh, people's lives because everyone was happy and it was in a great, uh, a great fertile valley for agricultural and, and logging. In the valleys of the Columbia, the bulldozers moved in. Scores of people were displaced from their property along the Duncan River, the Kootenai River, and in the Arrow Lake, 2,500 persons were torn from the land and forced to change their way. The death of the Sternwheeler Minter seemed to exemplify the passing of this older time. It wasn't, well, let's negotiate. <laughs> no such thing as negotiating at that time. I think the main regret is how they come in and just kind of railroaded you, you know. You didn't have an option to say, oh no, I'm not leaving, or oh no, this, you know, give me something comparable. It wasn't that way. It's, you do this and that's it. I mean, nothing, nothing involved about fairness as far as I can. I remember going down and because uh, I, I could start to see smoke coming from the farm. So I headed down and uh, you know the barn was burning what was left. Uh, the log house I just uh, dad I just arrived on the farm just as dad was finished getting uh, the log house to, uh, set fire to so I mean and those were buildings that uh, the house the log house is what he grew up in and what I spent my early years in and uh, the barn you know he maintained him and mum maintained you know removed snow in the winter so you know I don't know how he had the strength to basically destroy what was left of that, you know, after spending those years. We are very clumsy at estimating the value of so-called intangibles. No assessment of the value of flooded forest land was ever made but it amounted to over 80,000 acres. We approached the thing armed with a very simple formula. Growth and development equal prosperity. 
few people have bothered to attempt an assessment of the loss. By the time that uh, it was time to move out, the land had been mostly cleared, the, the building's gone, it was a dust bowl, and by then we were just glad to be out of there because there was nothing left, no buildings, and nothing but memories. And uh, I took my, my parents and some family friends back to where I had on the tugboat uh, a couple years after. And after they had been there, a Harding Rudd said, I really wish I had not gone back because I, I wish I could have remembered Arrowhead the way it was. And uh, I think that's the underlying factor is a lot of people, you don't really want to go back because memories are usually better than sometimes when you go back and see it's all rough landscape and rocks and logs. Uh, it's a very classic example, I think, of what happens when large-scale industry gets hold of a landscape. Uh, and a lot of people don't think of hydroelectric development necessarily as industrial development. We think of factories and we think of sawmills, but this is an industrially developed region. And nowhere is it more true in a concentrated fashion than in the areas uh, that back up water behind the Columbia River Treaty Dams. The loss to wildlife reads like a horror story. 8,000 deer, 600 elk, 1,500 moose, 2,000 black bears, 70,000 ducks and geese, all lost because the habitat on which their life depended was destroyed. In their thousands, they simply disappeared. loss from uh, losing our salmon is the nutrient contribution that they used to make to our streams and lakes. So, you know, one, one of the ways you can look at salmon and think of them functionally is there are these tiny things that leave the rivers and lakes be because there's not enough food for them there and nutrients swim all the way out to the ocean, swim way out in the North Pacific Ocean gathering food and nutrients the whole time, so growing from that size to that size, and then they return to the Columbia River, swim all the way upstream. When they spawn and die, then they release their nutrients to the streams and to the lakes, but also to the riparian vegetation and the trees. Restoring those floodplain repairing and wetland ecosystems is, you know, to my mind, a, a linchpin of restoring ecosystem function so we can have a diverse array of vegetation as opposed to the monoculture we largely have out here now and all the bird and animal species that, that go along with that. There are huge challenges. Um, but they're also saying, look, at we three generations of indigenous people have not had access to salmon and have not had, you know, meaningful amounts of salmon in their diet. And so it's time to change that and for people to be able to enjoy, you know, one of my favorite foods, absolutely my favorite food in the world, which is sockeye salmon. <laughs> I think we need to listen to those stories and be aware that the, the Columbia River is important for the lives of all of us. And uh, its health is reflective of our health and the health of our planet. You know, we are, we are like Coyote in that way, that we think that we know what's better for everybody else, for everything else, for, you know, that we are better than. But the reality is that 
Yes. If you want to learn how to live, if you want to learn how to appreciate life, you watch a salmon. You watch them fight. They fight to go home all the time. Who are we to decide that they can't go home, that they can't make it through there, that they can't do what they're intended to do? And I think that that piece of and I'm not saying we shouldn't be responsible. We should completely and totally do everything that we can to stop the pollution that's happening in the world. We should do what we can as individuals. We should do what we can as communities. But we can't, we're not, we're not above the Tamuch. We're not above the animals. And they have a wisdom that's deeper than ours. You can't separate us, even our names, in Aichkistko. It's the people of the place of the bull trout or the Dolly Varden. And I, I think about that because all of our stories, they don't tell you what's the lesson, what's the story, what, what's the thing, but I think about that and I think about that in that way that when we're taken away from here, there is a part of us that dies. And when we come back, there's a part of us that lives. And every time I come here, I feel that. And every time someone else comes here, they feel that. It feels like home. Yo, 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 y